Arizona 360 explores issues defining this election from the state's readiness. We are already able to start tabulating ballots. To what the latest polls say and how the results could reshape Arizona's political landscape. The Democrats, for the first time, have truly put Arizona on their map. Plus, departing Pima County supervisors offer their successor some advice about the job. Put service above ideology. And early voters sound off. I chose to vote in Arizona because Arizona is a swing state this year. Hello and welcome to an hour-long special election edition of Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thanks so much for joining us. With more than four and a half million registered voters, Arizona's election chief says she anticipates record turnout for November 3rd's general election. We asked Secretary of State Katie Hobbs about how her office is working with county recorders to ensure every vote gets counted. Here we are just a few days away, a lot of scrutiny facing this election. Tell us a bit about how prepared your office is. Well, I feel very confident both in our office and um, the election offices around the state. We've already seen a few weeks now of early voting, and that seems to be going very smoothly. And we were really fortunate in Arizona, number one, that we already had such robust participation in vote by mail. Um, so our efforts to ramp that up have really been successful. Additionally, um, we had our presidential preference election back in March when the pandemic was just getting off the ground here. And so um, we're able to deal with a lot of things real time. A lot of the challenges that we knew we would have headed into um, the August primary and this election. So just really able to um, learn lessons from there in terms of what we needed to plan and prepare for now. Can you give us some examples of some of the things that you know might be different this time around or how your office is trying to shift your work to be sure that the integrity is there on election day? Yeah, well, certainly we want voters to be safe and to not have to choose between their health and their right to vote. Um, and we've always had a lot of voting options in Arizona. In addition to voting by mail, um, most counties have offered some form of early voting in person. And, and I think voters um, should be prepared to possibly go to a different polling place than they normally go to. Um, we've had a lot of shift in polling places because of the pandemic, um, needing to go to larger facilities so that um, folks could be more spread out. Uh, but also just some facilities weren't available because of closures. And so, um, so that's a difference. And then just, you know, following all the health guidelines that you follow in other aspects of your life, uh, masking, gloves, whatever you need to, to be safe. Every county, every precinct is different. Can you give us a sense of what's going on behind the scenes across the state to prepare for this big day? We've been working really closely with all the county election offices. Um, we Early on, we were appropriated $9 million of federal funds uh, specifically for pandemic-related expenses for this election. And so we've been giving um, those funds to counties in uh, grants to reimburse for specific expenses, but we've, we've also worked really closely in terms of purchasing personal protective equipment, secure ballot drop boxes, all those needs that were there that we were able to have sort of more purchasing power at the statewide level and be able to get a larger volume of things uh, for less cost and distributing those to the county so that they're prepared. We're on weekly calls with the county um, election officials and obviously available for support outside of those weekly calls as well. There are nearly 4 million registered voters in the state of Arizona. 90% of them um, are registered to vote by mail. Does that take some of the pressure off of what's facing your office here this week? I think certainly the fact that um, most of our voters are on the permanent early voter list provides some certainty in terms of um, the planning that needs to be done for Election Day in terms of the expected turnout on Election Day. Um, but also because we know that voting by mail where it's possible is the safest way for people to vote. Um, we're able to, you know, focus on the safety of the voters and poll workers for those folks who do go vote in person. All eyes are on Arizona. I mean, it's a battleground state. What can we expect election night? Because as we know, not all precincts will be report, uh, reporting right away. But people are going to want to know what happens locally, at the state level, and of course, federally. 
Yeah, the great news about Arizona is that we are already able to start tabulating ballots. Uh, ballot tabulation starts 14 days before the election, so that started on October 20th. And, um, and so a large percentage of votes will already be tabulated on by election day. Throughout the night, those results that are coming in from election day polling places will be posted. Um, so we'll have a good uh, number of results. I think the number we don't know yet, and we won't know until maybe late at night on election night or possibly even the next morning, is how many people dropped off their ballots on election day. And those are the ones that still have to be processed, signature verified, and then um, tabulated. And so that's that's the, we don't know that number, so it's hard to predict the percentage of results we'll have in on election night. Rest assured, though, your office is prepared and waiting for those. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Secretary Katie Hobbs, thank you for your insight. Thanks so much. Arizona's emergence as a battleground state is supported by polls that show tight races for the White House and U.S. Senate. One of the firms tracking them from the onset is the Phoenix-based OH Predictive Insights. Its latest polls show Democratic candidates with slight leads in both of those closely watched races. Pollster Mike Noble discussed the methods used to gauge voters' preferences. Research is telling us this side around is that I don't really see to expect the type of polling errors that you saw mainly in some of those key battleground states that we saw back in 2016. I think the industry not only has really honed in and, and corrected itself for what those errors were uh, post-2016 in their analysis, but even for Arizona here uh, specifically, we've never had not only more polling uh, coming in, but the polling's never been more accurate. So uh, again, I don't, I don't see that to be a, a big of an issue uh, this time around. You know, a lot of people still question pollsters, especially after 16, when uh, Donald Trump wasn't doing so well in the polls and then Election Day was a very different story. Why should we trust you guys this time around? Well, I don't think you should, uh, you know, lump everybody in it for a few bad apples. Right. And so if you look at uh, our case, for example, when polling in the 2016 election, we called every single race correctly. So uh, we didn't have that miss issue. I mean, really, in the national, when you look at polling, the polling is actually more accurate it's ever been. It was within about a point of the actual national popular vote. The problem is people don't realize is that the popular vote does not determine who the president is. It's based on the electoral college and the road to 270. And the error really happened in three key states, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, where there's incredibly small margin of votes that uh, Trump landed up winning by. But again, they made an issue of undersampling those who didn't have a high school education and some other groups. So, but that has been uh, really been fixed this time around. A lot of the polls you've conducted most recently, they're showing that it's still a very tight race between Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Martha McSally, Mark Kelly. Tell me about the people that you're contacting, because many of us are getting calls and texts and we're dismissing them pretty quickly. So the people that you're contacting, how reflective are they of the average Arizonan? Well, there's a lot of different sampling techniques. You have random digital dial and these other uh, different ways. In my past life, I uh, ran campaigns as a political consultant. So uh, I kind of know the ins and outs from uh, the ground level. And so I would we do it based on uh, by uh, the voter file. Right. I mean, you have to be a registered voter in order to vote. Well, we have access to that information and then taking that voter list and randomizing it and then getting a statistically significant sample that is reflective of the population is then I think the secret of why we have such a strong record. And I think why we, you know, uh, basically are trusted source, because, again, it, it, the devil lies in the, the details, so to speak. And uh, again, very nuanced polling. But again, it's it's if it's talking to the right people, the right audience and uh, making sure it's reflective of that audience. People don't always tell the truth to pollsters. So how do you manage when people aren't exactly forthcoming about what they're going to decide on Election Day? Well, uh, I mean, to put it in perspective is that, you know, you hear this a lot. It's actually probably the most common thing brought up to me is uh, what if you're lying? It's like, yeah, we can't judge if it's lying. But for example, our last poll is an all live caller poll with professional interviewers. And we go through a battery of questions before we even get to uh, the actual horse race questions. And it's pretty easy to tell it's doing, but we, we haven't really seen that issue of the actual lying to voters. And not only that are to the pollsters, but also uh, you see is that undecided. I mean, in our last poll for president, for example, only 1% of the electorate was decide, uh, undecided. So again, the folks that are for Biden or for Trump are pretty adamant in their support. And that whole shy voter thing, there really hasn't been much evidence to actually really prove that. 
All right, so Mike, you've been doing this for a while now. Um, you tend to do quite extensive polling. What are your predictions for November 3rd? Well, in predictions, if you remember, we're talking about odds here. And so when you're looking at it right now is that I predict uh, that the election will be very close here in Arizona when it comes to the presidential contest. I think I could see Trump winning by one or two points or Biden winning up to about four points, but it will probably fall about right in there. But Arizona will be very close. And I think every vote matters. So if you haven't voted, I recommend getting out there, make sure your voice is heard because it really is going to make a national impact. And then when it comes to the Senate race, I think Mark Kelly has a bit of a, a bit, bit more of an edge compared to Biden does in the presidential uh, over his opponent, Martha McSally, where he has about a five point lead. There's five percent of voters undecided, but also he's been really doing well in fundraising and, and has had the advantage in broadcast spend. So I see uh, I, I would be I, Kelly has a, a very good shot at winning. And I would be actually pretty surprised if he came up short, frankly, uh, on the Senate contest. We're talking about tens of millions millions of dollars in the Senate race alone. Who are the real winners when you talk about the money spent in this state? Uh, all the vendors that they're paying the money towards. <laughs> so direct mail, digital, uh, you know, broadcast, all that stuff. And so you've seen that Arizona, we saw a taste of what it's like to be in the national, uh, uh, the, the national power struggle, whether it's to the control of the upper chamber of the Senate to, uh, in this case, you know, obviously a uh, room for president. And so we've seen that we saw a taste of what it's like to have a competitive race where that Senate race in the midterms in 2018 broke all records. This one has absolutely shattered all spending records when it comes to the Senate and presidential contest. And you have uh, President Trump basically making weekly visits to Arizona in the last month and also with uh, the Democratic campaign with Kamala Harris and Biden. So you see that Arizona, uh, you know, follow, follow the money and follow also uh, where the high profile folks are going. And they're going not to Florida and other states. They are a little bit, but Arizona's, again, it's going to be a key state and who wins the election. Mike Noble from OH Predictive Insights. Thanks so much for your time. Lorraine, thank you so much for having me. From the top of the ticket and down the ballot in races for the state legislature, we got analysis on the odds a blue wave could wash over Arizona's political landscape from KJZZ Steve Goldstein and the yellow sheets Hank Stevenson. Gentlemen, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, Hank, I want to start with you today. Arizona's long been a Republican stronghold, but then two years ago, uh, a Democrat named Kirsten Sinema beat out Martha McSally, and that changed things. What does that mean as we head in to yet another Senate race here in the next few days? Well, I think Sinema's election proved that the right kind of Democrat in Arizona has a path to victory. You know, she didn't call herself a Democrat. Uh, she never mentioned party labels. She ran as uh, something between a very conservative Democrat and a very uh, liberal Republican. And that kind of independence works in Arizona. Uh, it's kind of what you're seeing this year, uh, the exact same playbook out of the Mark Kelly campaign. And, you know, interestingly enough, they're both facing the same candidate who really hasn't changed her approach at all. Um, after she lost the uh, 2018 election, Martha McSally's consultants uh, put the blame on being too closely tied uh, to Donald Trump um, in a state that doesn't necessarily love Donald Trump. He turned off a lot of independent and moderate Republican voters. Um, and there's an argument to be made that that cost her the election. So, um, you know, it's all about turnout. Uh, it, will depend on how good a year this is for Democrats. But I think even if Donald Trump wins Arizona, there's a path to victory for a Democrat in that Senate race. Steve, what do you say? I mean, this strategy, will it work? Well, it certainly seems to, to work well. And, and going with what Hank said about the playbook, there was that so-called cinema playbook, which Mark Kelly has followed to a T. And a little bit easier for him is, of course, he doesn't have a voting record. And he is an astronaut and has popularity tied to that. I think that demographic shift in Maricopa County is a huge one. We have only seen once that I can think of, certainly in recent years, the superintendent of public instruction lost Maricopa County and yet Diane Douglas yet went on to win the race. Maricopa County is so dominant and Martha McSally is a, is a wounded candidate. And the fact that she lost last time around to Kirsten Cinema, she is still in that tweener category between, again, embracing President Trump and not. Mark Kelly, without question, is the favorite in this race. And I, I still see a scenario where it's possible where Kelly wins and Trump also wins, but 
the Trump-Biden race should be closer than Kelly McSally. Let's talk about that race because there are conservatives and there are Republicans. Are they still on the fence when it comes to Donald Trump, Steve? Well, there's certainly that case, Lorraine. What, what has struck me is the numbers we see of uh, favorable versus unfavorable, just generally across the country. And I think Arizona reflects this as well. The president's approval rating never goes higher than 42 or 43 percent. And yet at the same time, it stays there, which means people are not deserting him in the same way as certainly over the last couple of years that we've seen. But this is a very different map, a very different state from 2016 than, than it is now in 2020. Yeah. Well, you have to have the president getting more people on board other than the loyalists, and especially the reaction to the pandemic, the fact that he's, according to polls, losing senior voters who were so loyal to him, losing white males. That's almost an even split with Joe Biden at this point. And we know how far behind he is, Joe Biden, when it comes to females. So I, there's a path to victory for the president here, but it's going to be very difficult. I think a lot of it comes down to do independent swing 70-30 for Biden or more like 55-45? That's going to determine it. The Democrats, for the first time, have truly put Arizona on their map. Um, there's been some kind of dipping their toes in Arizona in previous elections, but this year they're all in. Um, and I think that investment of resources shows that they believe that they can actually win Arizona. There are a lot of states that they could be fighting over, and they're spending time and money here. Of the congressional seats, which are up for grabs? Steve, we'll start with you. Congressional races, Lorraine, there are two that we're looking at really closely. One is CD6, and that comes down to a lot of the fact that Dr. Harold Tipperneni, who's challenging Representative David Schweikert, has raised a ton of money, a record amount of money, and for a Democrat in that district, which even as recently as two years ago, Schweikert still won by double digits. He didn't win by 27 as he had in other years, but at least it's around 10 points or so for Anita Malik at the time. And because of his ethics woes, the fact that he actually admitted to 11 violations, had to pay a $50,000 fine, that has made his fundraising pretty tepid, especially for an incumbent. So that being said, that is a, a Republican-leaning district still, but it's really a toss-up. The one non-internal poll we've seen has Schweikert up by three, which is within the margin of error. That one still, you know, that, that's going to be neck and neck, no question. The other one is CD1 with Tom O'Halloran versus challenger Tiffany Shedd. O'Halloran is pretty moderate, used to be a Republican, then became a Democrat. He's in Congress. That district has a lot of Trump support, but it also has the Navajo Nation. It is, we always joke about that district being the size of many states in the in, in the country. So, but Shed came across very well in the one debate that the two of them did on television, whereas O'Halloran kept getting tied to Nancy Pelosi. We know that's an election year trick, but that's another one. I, I suspect the incumbents win both of those, but by very, very narrow margins. Yeah, same. Um, I, I really think that CD1 is probably not as uh, competitive um, as it has been in past years. I think this is going to be a good year for Democrats. I think there's going to be, you know, even some voters who um, will choose the president uh, a bit begrudgingly and maybe um, feel a little bit empowered to vote across the aisle farther down the ticket. So I think I think Tom O'Halloran is probably safe. And if I were betting, I would also bet on David Schweikert. But the fact that that district is even being talked about right now says something. All right, let's move on to some state races. I mean, voters are consumed with the presidency, the Senate, but there are also some state legislative races. We'll be watching. Where does all this money come from? I think all over the place. Um, we're seeing a massive infusion of money um, from outside of the state to help out the Democrats um, because Arizona actually could flip uh, one or both of its legislative chambers for Democrats. We're within uh, three uh, seats in the Senate and two seats in the House um, of flipping those districts. And national Democrats look at that and say, hey, bang for your buck, we can get a lot out of spending money in Arizona. And the Democrats have uh, drawn very aggressive maps this year. They are spending money in areas I would have never expected, areas that I laughed, when literally laughed when they first announced that they were spending money in. But they're doing this based on polling. They're doing this based on some sort of uh, data and metrics that show them that even these districts that two years ago would have just seemed um, far out of reach, maybe this year are worth spending some money in and seeing if, um, if they can flip them. 
Steve, does Governor Ducey need both houses to remain in Republican control to finish out the remainder of his term? I would suspect, Lorraine, at this point, that is a pretty good bet. Um, we, if we see the last two years now again, maybe that's why Governor Ducey is playing so closely to President Trump and greeting him with such enthusiasm when he comes to visit the state, because maybe if President Trump were to win and Democrats were to turn the legislature, maybe the governor realizes his power will be limited. I just don't see a scenario, Lorraine, in which the governor plays nice with two houses, the House and Senate, both being in Democratic hands. If one or the other flips, we could see some very interesting political calculus there, because there are some people certainly who are willing to work with the governor on certain things. Maybe we see additional K-12 funding. All that being said, how does the pandemic ultimately make the state budget look? That we, that might make people strange bedfellows as well we haven't seen before. All right, tens of millions of dollars spent in Arizona this campaign season. Who's the real winner? Hank, start with you. Uh, not print media. I, I don't know, the, te <laughs> the television stations, I guess. Uh, I assume they pick up a lot of money. And anytime I turn on the TV, I'm just flooded with political ads. And I know that, you know, a lot of the uh, local businesses that usually advertise can't afford airtime this month. Um, so I guess the political operatives and the television stations are probably the big winners here. Lorraine, probably people who have DVRs or TiVos because they can fast forward through most of those commercials. Because when we have spot sets where we have Mark Kelly, pro Kelly, pro McSally, then anti Kelly, then pro Kelly, then from we're seeing six commercials in a row of all these campaigns and it's it's even for those of us who are junkies it, it's a bit much my thanks to both of you we'll have you back and we'll uh we'll see if you have any other thoughts post-mortem thanks thanks lorraine take care thanks, lorraine. the majority of votes tallied in this election will come from maricopa county the most populous in arizona History shows candidates for national races will need to carry Maricopa to win. The race for every vote is continuing up until Election Day. Tony Banyagua spoke to party leaders and has more. Phoenix and the rest of Maricopa County have an estimated population of about 4.6 million people. That's more than half of Arizona's total number of residents. And in this year's election, the parties know that voters here could decide close races. This election is going to come down to turnout. It's going to be who gets out their base to vote. And we are working hard to get out every single vote here in Maricopa County, as well as sway the independents to vote our way. The Republican enthusiasm is off the charts. We've been registering more voters into the Republican Party and our voters are turning out. I think that this is going to be a great election for Republicans. The stakes are crucial for both major parties and no one is taking anything for granted four more years in that beautiful White House. President Trump has visited Arizona several times and his supporters are also getting out the vote. They're holding events throughout the county, hoping to encourage other like-minded residents to vote. Ashley DeLauro moved to the Phoenix area from Michigan 15 years ago. She cast her ballot for Trump in 2016 and she's backing him again. I'm here because I love Trump. He's a wonderful president, probably the best I've had in my lifetime. You know, I'm only 30, so I haven't had a lot, but he's done a lot for my family. I, you know, we have two incomes and we have one son, and for a while we were struggling, and then Trump got elected, and it seems like we have more money coming in, we have more opportunities, feels like for everyone. The Democrats are forgoing large gatherings due to the pandemic, so much of their work is online, on the phone, or in smaller settings. 23-year-old Amber Rivera is originally from the Bronx, but her family moved to Arizona when she was eight years old. She's the president of the Maricopa County Young Democrats. We have an amazing lineup of candidates, and we have so many people doing such great work on the ground here in the county that I'm extremely confident that we're going to flip this county blue, and it will solely be because of the community to make sure that people know that there's somebody on this ballot that reflects your values. Here are some figures about this region. Maricopa County is the fastest growing county in the nation, adding about 200 people per day. It has about 2.6 million registered voters this year, making it the second largest voter jurisdiction in the country after Los Angeles County. And while Republicans hold a majority at nearly 836,000 registered voters, Democrats and non-affiliated have more than 700,000 registered voters each. At the Maricopa County Recorder's Office, the stacks of ballots reflect the community's interest and enthusiasm. 
The county is using part-time workers to supplement its regular staff and the machines are operating like never before. So we have this new equipment that counts ballots about six to 8,000 ballots per hour versus the old equipment that we had since the 90s that counted about 3,000 ballots per hour. This is happening in a restricted area that is visible but not accessible to the media or non-official visitors. About 2.1 million voters requested an early ballot and already we have seen more than 50% of those returned. Erica Flores says Maricopa County has been working to expand opportunities for voters. They include multiple drive through ballot sites and increasing the number of vote centers in the county. So voters have had the opportunity to vote starting October 7th all the way to Election Day on November 3rd. And so the vote centers, we started off with seven, moved up to about 50. We're going to move up to close to 100 and then 150 and then on Election Day, 175 locations. So places outside of Arizona have been coming down to see how we've been doing this. There's a lot of voters in Maricopa County. And so, of course, it's very, very important. I think that Arizona is, um, is really what unlocks victory across the entire nation. The good news is that President Trump has the key. You have gotten a lot of national, international attention. Yes. Tell us about yes, that, please. I have done more interviews with international press in the last few weeks than I have in the five years I've been chair. I've done interviews with Canada, Italy, Spain, England, Ireland, Scotland. I'm gonna be live on the BBC on election night worldwide. The eyes of the world are literally on Maricopa County and that shows the importance of this county. Our election special continues with analysis of the major ballot propositions. We shift gears to focus on races in Pima County. But first, at polling sites in downtown Tucson and the U of A, we heard firsthand from early voters. Why am I voting? I feel that it's my responsibility to my community. I'm voting to be able to choose um, a part of my future. I just turned 18, so you have to vote. You know, it's your duty as a citizen to vote. I have voted in every election since I turned 18. It is a simple yet significant way to help my community. Well, we always vote, but it's extremely important this year. <laughs> We're, we're in a mess. I wasn't able to vote in the 2016 election, um, and that was really monumental, I think. I think this has been like the most polarized election that I voted in. Us turning out to vote in record numbers speaks to what our state needs. This year feels scary um, and confusing. I try to treat every election that I've voted in with the same amount of sincerity. So the difference I think in this election is, is really just generated around all the COVID and all the extra precautions that people have to take in order to come down and make sure the vote gets, gets you know, counted. My vote matters because every vote matters. We all have our own opinions and um, yeah, mine matters just as much as anyone else's. I'm actually an out-of-state student, but I chose to vote in Arizona because Arizona's a swing state this year, so I thought my, my voice essentially would be more important and more heard in Arizona. Even though we have the Electoral College and, you know, they're the ones that kind of elect who our president is, it's still nice to be able to determine, like, the policies that we have in the state um, on a county level. Especially with, I think, the, the local elections, um, I understand the community that I'm part of. And it's important, I think, as a mother to set an example. My parents have always like talked about how important it is. Like, they took me to go vote with them when I was little. I think in the past I felt um, like I've been heard, and now I'm not sure. As young people, I feel like we're not represented a lot. Although my vote is only worth one, my hope is that it comes with many, many more to, to save our democracy.
Welcome back and thanks again for joining us for an hour long special focusing on the election. Arizonans are also voting on two statewide propositions. In short, Prop 207 legalizes recreational marijuana and Prop 208 imposes a tax on high earners to fund educators. For analysis on both, I'm joined by Arizona Public Media's Elisa Resnick and Jake Steinberg, who have covered the propositions on NPR 89.1. My thanks to both of you for being here. Now let's begin with Prop 207, which you focused on, Elisa. So remind our viewers how it would change the state's laws when it comes to marijuana. Yeah, Lorraine, so the new proposition, Prop 207, or the Smart and Safe Act, would decriminalize recreational use and, and allow for recreational sale here in Arizona. Now, medical marijuana has been legal in the state since 2010 are more than 250,000 uh, medical marijuana card holders here in the state. So proponents of this bill argue that marijuana, the marijuana industry is already here. So this would be um, about decriminalizing recreational use and, and allowing for, uh, for the state to benefit from that revenue coming from, from recreational sale. This is the second time the state has tried to pass the bill. A similar measure uh, failed narrowly in 2016. So given that this proposition had already come before voters, they're having to tailor their message differently. There's also not the same funding sources for or against. Um, how are How is the, the campaign different this year? Well, this year the campaign also focused on a, a criminal justice, uh, justice aspect of, of drug policy. Um, it does have an expungement clause, which would allow people who were previously convicted of marijuana related felonies to apply for expungement. The polling shows this is a very close uh, race when it comes to this proposition. Are the opponents having any success getting their message across? The opponents are, are, sim are the same opponents as, as were present in 2016. They argue that, you know, there is a public safety aspect to this bill as well. And that there is, you know, they, they do point to the, the amount of money coming from the marijuana industry as being you know, sort of a, a red flag in the sense that this is not necessarily coming from Arizona voters. Additional marijuana use, though, would still be a federal crime. So if this comes to fruition and if it passes, how do law enforcement agencies manage this um, if it's legal in the state, but illegally when it comes to the federal government? Yeah, that will be a difficult question. You know, proponents argue that these laws have had time, at, um, you know, since the first states, Colorado and Washington state legalized in 2012, they argue that, you know, states like Arizona have had time to really refine these bills specific to how federal law enforcement deals with it versus state law enforcement. There, there are still a lot of questions, as you mentioned. And for example, Saharita just passed an ordinance that would ban recreational stores in the city itself. And so, you know, local local law enforcement and local governments do still have a little bit of that power to kind of decide, even if this bill does pass in the state of Arizona, you know, what it'll actually look like in their cities. All right. Thank you, Elisa. Let's move on now to Prop 208. Uh, Jake, proponents of this measure tried to get it on the ballot in 2018, but it failed. So tell us what happened and how they managed to succeed this time around so voters will be able to decide on this. Sure. So... I mean, to get a measure on the ballot, you need to get a certain number of signatures on your petition. And Arizona law says that petition needs to have a hundred word maximum description of the uh, measure and what it would do. It doesn't have to have everything it would do, but it's got to have sort of the key provisions there. And that's kind of what sunk the 2018 measure. The uh, Arizona Supreme Court ruled that the uh, measure on the or the language on the measure's petition um, was misleading because it said that there would be a percent increase and not a percentage point increase. It's a technicality, but it was enough to get uh, it struck from the ballot. So uh, this year's measure is nearly identical, um, and it almost was struck from the ballot for the same reason. A Maricopa County Superior Court judge. Um, had the same ruling that the language was misleading, but this time actually the Arizona Supreme Court um, ruled the opposite way. They said, no, uh, it's fine. Um, voters can decide on this. Now, this has been referred to as a tax on the wealthy, but what is the income threshold and then how much money would it actually generate? Sure. So 
like I said, it's it's pretty much identical to the measure that was put forward in 2018. It would be a 3.5 percentage point increase on high earners. So that's income over $250,000 for an individual filer and income over $500,000 for a married couple or someone filing um, as head of household. And so the uh, Joint Legislative Budget Committee, which reviews every ballot measure, um, has found that the measure would raise $827 million in its first year, which is about 13% of what the state spent on uh, education this year. And that figure is less than some of the supporters have said. That they're throwing around figures like a billion dollars, but it's actually more than um, what some opponents of the measure say it would raise. One of the criticisms has been is that this would negatively affect small businesses. So what's the argument there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of, or some small businesses, I should say, file income um, under those individual rates, um, pass-through income, they call it. You know, the argument goes that you're, you are raising taxes here on small businesses even higher uh, than the corporate tax rate. Arizona's corporate tax rate is about 4.9%. The rate would for, uh, for higher earners would raise from 4.5% all the way to 8%. And some business groups uh, argue that this is gonna really negatively affect Arizona's economy. One um, analysis from the Goldwater Institute, a sort of libertarian uh, think tank here in Arizona, estimated that uh, the, the measure could result in over 100,000 jobs lost over the next decade due to the, the costs um, on, from small businesses going to their employees. Now, if this passes, then it would become law, but there has to be some stipulations about how it's written into the state tax code. So what does this tell us about how the funds can actually be spent should it pass? The language of this measure says that half of the money raised would go to schools as grants for hiring teachers and increasing teacher salaries. And then another quarter would go to schools, again, as grants to hire and, and increase pay for what they call student support personnel. So that's counselors and bus drivers, cafeteria workers, etc. And then the rest would go to um, you know, funds for teacher training and retention programs. All right. My thanks to both of you for your reporting. We look forward to more on this as uh, the election draws uh, much closer here in the days ahead. And on election night, Elisa and Jake will track the results on Props 207 and 208. You can listen for updates on NPR 89.1 and follow their coverage on azpm.org. We now turn our attention to Pima County, where voters will select the leaders they want to guide public policy on the Board of Supervisors. All seats on the Pima County Board of Supervisors appear on the ballot. Two supervisors are up for re-election. That includes District 3 Sharon Bronson, a Democrat, and the current board's longest serving member who's vying for a seventh term. Her opponent, Republican Gabby Salcedo Mercer, previously challenged Democratic Congressman Raul Grijalva in 2014 and 2012. In District 4, Republican Steve Christie is also running for another term against Democrat Steve Diamond. If re-elected, it's guaranteed the incumbents will serve alongside at least three newcomers to the board. Republican Allie Miller announced late last year she would not run again. District 1 voters have a choice between Republican Steve Spain and Democrat Rex Scott. District 2 Supervisor Ramon Valadez lost his Democratic primary bid to Matt Hines, pitting him against Anthony Sizer. And in District 5, the sudden death of longtime Supervisor Richard Elias in March led the board to appoint retired county housing official Betty Viegas to serve the rest of his term. Democrat Adelita Grijalva and Republican Fernando Gonzalez now seek to fill the seat. We checked in with Viegas to ask about her brief time on the board and what advice she has for other first-term supervisors. Now you've served on the board since April. Are, are you able to say now that some six, seven months later that you were able to accomplish much during that short span of time, of course, given the pandemic? I believe that we have. I honestly, um, when I went in, I went in with the mentality that I wasn't just gonna be a vote. I was going to be 
uh, working with community and working with my staff to accomplish what Richard had started and not finished, and then to also start some other initiatives that needed to be started based on what was going on with the pandemic. How much does partisan politics play into things? I mean, when you have Democrats and Republicans, and then you're talking about government functioning at the local level. That's been the hardest part because there's just, there were, we have two different ideologies and we can't, you know, the, the, these two Republicans and us can just never come to any type of, um, of agreement, you know, or, or re even reasonable agreement, unless, of course, it has to do with planning and zoning issues, you know, which are mostly in their districts. <laughs> so how would you describe that dynamic? Because you came out of retirement to fill this role for, you know, the time being. And, and as you mentioned, Democrats and Republicans, what's that dynamic like on the board? You know, we really don't communicate. There's there is absolutely no communication between us other than the board meeting and maybe a couple of memos that come around but even that you know it's, it's there's really no communication i've been thinking about somebody new coming in that's never worked for the county um and how what are the challenges going to be for them and obviously it's going to be depending on their staff, if they bring in staff that has has never worked for the county, it's going to be difficult um, if they don't know um, the, the different departments and who the who the uh, the contacts are. Uh, the majority of the seats on this board are up for grabs. I mean, three of the five will be decided here in the next week. Uh, what do you think that board needs to better serve this community at it as it continues to evolve? Well, obviously, the number one priority right now is what's going on with the COVID virus and and the and the cases that seem to be going up. Watching your area, watching your. Um, your district to see where are the hotspots. And that's one of the first things I did is I, I looked to see, okay, where is this happening? You know, and and what can we do to stop it? And so if you start there, then you can best serve your constituents by watching out for them, right? I mean, that's what we're there for. Okay, Betty Viegas, Pima County Supervisor, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. After hearing from Viegas, we pose similar questions to longtime Supervisor Valadez. Appointed to his seat in 2003, he is the second longest serving member on the board after Bronson. Now, you have served on the Pima County Board of Supervisors since 2003. You have a really good idea of how this community has changed. What would you say the dynamic is today? You know, one of the things that we've actually been really successful in doing is the dynamic uh, uh, post uh, recession was that we actually were a one trick pony in terms of economic development. So myself, Supervisor Bronson uh, and Mr. Huckleberry got together and started having about two to three years worth of roundtables with businesses of all different sizes, with our municipal partners, with our private partners to really start developing an economic development plan that really had this in mind, okay? If you weren't gonna to go to work at Raytheon or for government, there was a, well, really wasn't a place to find employment once you graduate from the university or from Pima College. Today, that's changed uh, or continues to change. Pre-COVID-19, uh, uh, since about 2013, we had uh, created, along with our partners, almost 49,000 direct and indirect jobs through that economic development plan to diversify the economy so that regardless of what sector you were in, you would be able to get a good job where you can support your family and be able to stay in Tucson and have the sort of life that you were raised uh, uh, having. Now, what sort of role would you say the supervisors have played in creating these opportunities? Because you often get the rap for not doing enough or not looking at um, this community as diverse as it really is. Right, uh, and I think to a great degree, uh, some of it uh, might have some merit, but, but most of it really doesn't. If you take a look at what we were able to do, we created the first economic development plan for our region with the cooperation of every single municipality, 
with all your utility companies and with public and private partnerships. So it really wasn't just the county, but it was uh, it, we, we led the way in that creation. The credit belongs to all our partners. Now, we've had you on the show before, and we've talked about the dynamic on the board. What would you say it needs moving forward? What I've seen is a shift away from, from being able to have a, a sit-down discussion and disagree uh, to what we've got today, where if someone disagrees with you, you're just, they're just wrong. What I think we need to do is make sure that we understand that we're all different. And that not only is that okay, that's fantastic. Because by looking at the same problem through all these diverse viewpoints, we can actually find a better, greater solution most times than we could if we all just agreed. And finally, Ramon, what advice would you give to this next board that will be very different from the board you knew back in 2003 when you started? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, not only the board, but the times. Uh, I would go back to the message again. Um, public service, particularly in elected office, is exactly about service. Put service above ideology. To, in today's world, we hear a lot about ideology, and it seems to be first and foremost. Well, I don't hear ideology in the word public service. It's public service. Let's put service first. Ideology comes second. All right. Supervisor Valadez, thank you so much. Thanks, Lorraine. It's a pleasure to be with you. We also extended an invitation to Supervisor Miller to appear on our program, but her office did not respond to multiple requests. Aside from supervisors, Pima County has a number of other key posts on the ballot that include sheriff, treasurer, county recorder, and county attorney, although Democrat Laura Conover runs unopposed. We discuss the attention on local races with the Arizona Daily Star, Sarah Garrett Gasson, and the Green Valley News, Sahuarita Sun's Dan Shear. What really matters to the average person in Southern Arizona right now? Well, I think the overarching concern for all of us is COVID. Um, the health implications of that, the economic implications of that, and the educational implications of that. I think that is something that we heard from candidate after candidate when we did our endorsements. And we've been doing a lot of outreach to, to readers and to voters, and that's what we hear over and over again. Dan. I think for the first time in many, many years, people really care who's gonna be elected president. And that sounds a little odd, but I think in the past people felt like they could kind of live with the other side if uh, their candidate didn't win. But I think this time people feel like there's an awful lot on the line and they really care about that presidential race, which of course is gonna reverberate and affect all the other down ballot races. All right, Dan, I wanna follow this up. They care about the presidency, maybe the Senate. Are they watching any of the local races that are occurring within their communities? The attention is really on the Mark Kelly, Martha McSally race and on the presidential race. And uh, there are some really important things on the ballot this time. County recorder is one of them. It's one of those things you don't think about, but that's really where a lot of our attention should be because uh, it's such a powerful position coming open for the first time in almost 30 years. So, uh, so no, we're not hearing much else other than what's at the top of the ticket, but the other stuff probably is gonna affect people more. We've been hearing a lot in letters to the editor about the sheriff's race against uh, Chris Nanos and Mark Napier. We've been hearing a lot about the Senate race, as you said, uh, the congressional races as well. And you're absolutely right that the, we think in terms of you know the big picture presidential election, which in this case I think is monumental, but it really is the farther down you go on the ballot, the more real life sort of uh, touch those, those roles have on everyday lives. All right, Dan, the Green Valley News, Sahuarita Sun, didn't endorse any candidate or issue. And, and Sarah, I know the Arizona Daily Star did. Do, do people count on those? Do they need that before they, they go to the polls? I don't think that that's what our readers want from us. I think what they want is that we have access to the candidates. We can talk to them, interview them, ask the questions. If we're in touch with our communities, we're asking the right questions, the questions that our readers have, and then they want the answers to those questions. They don't wanna to be told 
how to vote. Uh, I've been here almost 12 years and we have never done endorsements. Uh, we will on occasion endorse on issues, particularly school bonds, things that are very, very local, but we uh, will not on the candidates. And Sarah, the Arizona Daily Star continues with endorsements and it seems every election cycle you've taken heat for it. So why continue? Um, we see it as part of our community service, public service role. We're not telling people you have to vote for this person. We're saying we've had the time and the um, access to talk to all these people. Here's what's important to us as an editorial board and a community, and here's what we think. This time around, uh, because of the pandemic, we were all working from home and we couldn't have candidates come in to the newspaper. And that actually turned out to be something that I thought was really beneficial to uh, to Sonens because we held our endorsement board interviews on Zoom and invited people to participate. And we had uh, a really good turnout for, we did more than 20 of them. And we had people from the public uh, participating in every single one. In fact, some of the people went to all of them. We got a lot of really good feedback from that process. All right, real quick before we go, guys, thoughts on the Pima County Board of Supervisors. I mean, this is, for the first time, there's going to be a bit of a change of guard, maybe. What do you think, Sarah? Well, I think in uh, District 1, with uh, the Republican uh, chosen Allie Miller uh, candidate, uh, Steve Spain. I think he's he he has a certain base. He has uh, that Allie Miller sort of Republican hardcore base. I think Rex Scott, the Democrat running, um, who the star endorsed, and I've known um, from his time in TUSD, just um, as an aside, I think that's a really pivotal race in terms of the future of the Board of Supervisors overall, because if if Rex Scott uh, is elected, I think there will be um, kind of a repudiation of some of the, the Republican, more far right leaning, and I don't even wanna say Republican, but the, the Ali Miller School of Governing, um, and Steve Spain, I have to say, is uh, I'm going to go out and say I he is not a great candidate. But the um, as far as the other races, there is a, an opportunity for Pima County to sort of take a breath, take a kind of be refreshed, and start a new chapter. I think. I think the candidates are exciting. I think they're engaged. And I think that that the, a, a new direction could be interesting. Yeah, and that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be the same old stuff that we've been used to, whether Steve Spain gets in there or not, uh, or, or Rex Scott and I, and I, uh, I, there are a whole lot of Republicans in District 1 who think Steve Spain is actually a really good candidate. And so we'll see. But uh, I think people were growing tired of Allie Miller. But when it comes down to it, you're probably going to have at least three Democrats on that board. And it's going to be the same old, same old. Adelita Grijalva is going to be the same as uh, Richard Elias was. And uh, I think the very interesting one probably will be if Matt Hines gets in there and there's a really good chance he will for District 2, which is where I happen to live. I believe that uh, he is going to be very pragmatic and even keeled and even objective in his views. So he might be an interesting one there. But for the most part, Pima County Board of Supervisors is going to be operated like it like it has been for the last you know 400 years. So all right, 400 years. Well, then let's stay tuned for that. My thanks to both of yes. you. We'll have you on again here in the next few months. <laughs> For a guide to voting in Pima County, visit azpm.org. Our elections page also includes Q&As with candidates for Pima County Board of Supervisors. And finally, in many casual conversations about politics in 2020, you hear the word polarize used often. Some think the pandemic might exacerbate partisan divides in our communities, but a study from University of Arizona political scientist Samara Klar reveals an unexpected silver lining. From Arizona Illustrated producer Brian Nelson, here's politics as unusual. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He's a fool. 
an absolute fool to talk that way. Candidates, Congress people, elites in Washington are without any doubt more extreme and more polarized than the American public themselves. And this is a trend that we have seen going on for several, several years. In fact, most Republicans and most Democrats are really quite ideologically moderate. So, you know, when an issue isn't particularly important to somebody, that's when we see the biggest level of polarization among voters. So if something's not that important to you, it makes sense to say, well, what are the people that I, who share my party affiliation doing on this? I'll support them. When issues become a lot more personal to people, something like, say, coronavirus, something that actually scares you, something that's in your community, that's when we see people actually start even-handedly evaluating information. So I, I did a uh, really interesting study with some co-authors across the country at different universities. And what we find is that when coronavirus cases are really low, that's when there's a lot of polarization between what Democrats and Republicans think about the virus. But what's interesting is that as coronavirus increases in someone's county, then we see partisans really coming together. And I think that's why we do see, for example, here in Arizona, a large majority of people who wear masks and who want mask mandates, despite the fact that they're not uniformly getting that message, particularly from Republican elites. Uh, so, you know, there is more polarization in Washington. Once issues become important, that's where we see Democrats and Republicans starting to come to some agreement. Hi, everybody. I really like to talk to strangers about politics. A lot of people don't. So when I'm on an airplane, for example, if somebody asks what I do, I happily tell them I'm a political scientist because it will inevitably lead them into some sort of rant about their views on politics. And I love hearing it. I love hearing what people have to think about politics because those are people that I'm not going to be exposed to otherwise. And those are important sources of cross-cutting information. You know, it's important to be exposed to information with which you disagree. I think what's really important to remember is that everybody identifies with all sorts of different groups. And the fact is, when we ask Americans, which are the identity groups that are most important to you, consistently partisanship is ranked dead last. Most of the time, people truly don't, they don't care to think about their part partisanship. They don't want to think about politics. They want to think about all the other things that are important to them. So I think we need to be really specific here. When we think about tension between Democrats and Republicans, are we talking about the way Americans think about Democrats and Republicans in Washington, or are we talking about the way people feel about each other? And we see much less antagonism and much less hostility when it comes to evaluating actually members of our community. Republicans are wearing masks, Democrats are wearing masks. Republicans are worried about their health, they're worried about their jobs, they're worried about their kids. Democrats are worried about the exact same things. And so you see a lot of unity in the concerns that people are expressing. That's what I think is really important when you're to think about or to remind yourself of when you're speaking to someone from the other party. It doesn't take long to find something where you can really connect. That's all for now. Join us this Tuesday for PBS NewsHour's live primetime coverage of the 2020 general election. Arizona 360 will also offer live updates about local races that evening. To get in touch, visit us on social media or send an email to Arizona360 at azpm.org and let us know what you think. We'll see you next week.